We are continuing our walk through Hebrews chapter 11, the seven characteristics that we find in the Word of God about what true faith in God really is, what it really looks like. And we're given this opportunity to compare what the Hebrew writer says in explaining about what true faith looks like with our own faith, with our own lives. How do we see ourselves in light of this standard that God's Word has for us? What kind of faith it is that is pleasing to God? The true faith that He rewards. Let's pray, shall we? God, now is your time. Father, my prayer this morning is that we would bow before you in worship. That we would not just nod to you, but God, we would open up our hearts and our minds to you this morning. That you would speak clearly. That, Father, you would accomplish whatever work it is that you want to accomplish today. God, I don't want to leave this room the same way I came in. I want to be shaped and changed a little bit more like your son, Jesus. And God, I cannot do that. But you can. So would you do that for us this morning? And, and God, not just for us, but also for our brothers and sisters here in other churches in northern Thailand, and specifically the church called Sinai Church. Speak through Pastor Yod Nanchai. And Father, give the truth of your word so clearly through his lips that, Lord, change would come as well. Father, we want to sit at your feet. We want to meet with you today. And we, we come before you, God, with this audacious prayer because we know you are here right now in this room with us and that you want to accomplish this work in us. Father, we bow before you, submit our will to your will. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, we're going to be covering three verses today. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 20 through 22. This is the fifth characteristic of what true faith looks like from the book of Hebrews chapter 11. But go ahead and keep your finger there. I really think that in order for us to understand what the Hebrew writer is saying here, we need to go back a little bit all the way back to something that Jesus said in John 15, verses 1 and 2. John 15, verses 1 and 2. Jesus says this to his disciples, those that have faith in him. There are some that doubt, but some that are there for their own reasons. But Jesus turns to his disciples and says this, listen, Actually, no, let me, let me quantify that. All those there are listening now. Judas has left. And Jesus is telling the last thing on his heart to those that truly believe in him, that have true faith in him. But it doesn't always reflect itself truly. And Jesus says this, John 15, verses 1 and 2. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, this concept is simple, isn't it? We get this picture of a vine and branches, and the vine dresser knows what he's doing. He knows what it's going to take for those branches that are connected to the vine, that are getting their life from the vine, what it's going to take for those branches to bear more fruit. He knows where to trim. Look what he says again in verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, my father, the vine dresser, takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. How many of us have ever actually done gardening? Raise your hand. We've ever had pruning shears or scissors or maybe a sharp knife, whatever, in our hands. Okay, some of us. Others have seen others, and we can understand this concept. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of us have ever seen the vine fight back. It's not done. We don't ever see a bush dodging and weaving. 
But sometimes as we seek to walk by faith, we resist the pruning shears. See, a pruning shear does one thing. It cuts and removes. This is different than obeying God. Yes, a characteristic that we've seen of true faith in God is to obey Him. What He tells us, we do, even if we don't understand it. And this is even different than what we talked about last week with the idea of how God tests our faith to see if we're listening and obeying and walking in faith. This is different. This is realizing something very important. We need to let the vine dresser cut it away, whatever it may be. That there's a loss, that there is a decision and a choice that has to be made, that we say, God, I am okay if you take this away. Because I know you're good, and I know your will for me is good. That's what the Hebrew writer is wanting to point us to this morning. Go to John 15, verse 16. Just at the beginning, we see the same idea that Jesus is expounding there. He's saying, you did not choose me, but I chose and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. See it there? God says, I've chosen you for my purpose. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And that's true for every single one of us here who is a true believer in Jesus Christ, who have given our lives to God. What happened is that we responded to the drawing of the Father to the truth of His Son. We were dead in our sins, but God drew us, and we responded in faith to that drawing, and we were chosen to believe. The scripture is very clear, but we still had to respond. And God says, not only did I choose you, but I appointed you. You see it there? I appointed you. I have a plan for you that is my will for your life. We also have to choose to accept that as well. Amen? Because we struggle with that. And so as we turn now to Hebrews chapter 11, I love how true and real God's Word is. When He gives us such deep theology, He he wraps it up in human flesh. We get these stories of real people, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, who walked in similar ways that we walk and had to make the same choices. They still had to say, God, I believe that your will is better than my will. And I let you cut away my desires. That is what the Hebrew writer is showing us this morning. I'll even tell you, the fifth characteristic of faith in God is true faith in God bows to the will of God for our life. True faith in God bows to God's will for our lives. Don't just obey, but willingly says, I'm happy to be where God wants me to be. I'm happy to be facing the circumstances God has for me. Let's see how the Hebrew writer says this. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 20 to 22. It says, By faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. You know, when you to look at that first, it could be really confusing. What in the world is he talking about? Well, keep in mind that the Hebrew writer is writing to who? The Jews. The Hebrews. That's why it's called Hebrews. And these Jews grew up knowing the Old Testament, knowing the stories of the forefathers and the patriarchs, and knowing what this might refer to. We've got a, 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 an exciting time this morning in God's Word. We're going to try to cover about 26 verses of, chapter gen, of, of chapters in Genesis, 26 chapters of the book of Genesis. So I hope you're ready to listen close and you've got your seatbelt fastened. 
But I want you here in Hebrews chapter 11 to look at the time that the Hebrew writer is highlighting. He's not highlighting their whole life, where they're born, what their mom and dad's name is. No, he's saying, look at the specific time. Verse 20, by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. When did Isaac do this? When he thought it was the end of his life. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob, when dying, he even highlights it there, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Some of your translations may say head of his bed or edge of his bed. That's because Hebrew doesn't have vowel markers. And so either one works because it's talking about the end of his life, that Jacob was bedridden at the end of his life when this happened. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. See, in each one of these accounts, the Hebrew writer is drawing our attention to the expected end of these men's lives and how they ended in faith. Each verse is, by faith they did this. By faith they did this. You know, the easiest way to see if someone truly was a believer in Jesus Christ is to wonder how they ended. Are they focused on God and His Word? Are they focused on future things? Are they wanting the next generation to keep the chain link hard and strong? We are here because of so many countless brothers and sisters in Christ who lived the truth and would not let the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ die. Amen? We have a long history that we're indebted to. And here we see these three men at the end of their life, by faith, saying, do not forget the promises of God. And as we look at each one of these lives, we can see that they weren't perfect. They were just like you and me. But they had to learn this lesson. It is good when the pruning occurs. Say that with me. It is good when the pruning occurs. By the end of this message, I hope that we really truly believe that. Because it is true. The first one we see here, Isaac was broken. Turn to Genesis chapter 25, verses 23, and then we're going to look at verse 28. We're going to do a synopsis picture of what the Hebrew writer is pointing to. How are we to understand that true faith is willing to accept the will of God for our lives no matter what that will might be? And what we see in the life of Isaac is that he didn't at first. See, in Genesis chapter 25, we come across the story of Isaac. He's married to his wife named Rebecca, and she's got twins inside. She couldn't be pregnant for a while. They prayed and asked God to give her a baby, and he gave her two. And they are wrestling inside of her to the point that she actually goes to God and says, God, what is going on? And God says, I'm glad you asked. That's why I had this problem, so that you would come to me so I can tell you this. And look what he says in verse 23. And the Lord said to Rebekah, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. And this is important now. The older shall serve the younger. Even before Esau and Jacob were born, and that's the two babies in this womb. Even before they had done good or bad, Paul says to the Romans in Romans chapter 9, God chose who would be a part of his plan and who would not. Who, through whom would the line of the Messiah come? And who would not? If you think about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, there's a whole lot of people that are not mentioned there. Because the line went from father to son to father to son to father to son. Not brothers, but one. And God was the one who chose who would be the one through who the promise would come. And God says, I've chosen your younger to serve the older. Esau, the oldest, would serve Jacob, the youngest. That was God's plan. And God tells Rebekah this very clearly. Jacob will rule over Esau. But now comes the problem. 
Daddy doesn't like that. Isaac's not thrilled with that plan. The Bible even makes a point of telling us in verse 28, Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. See, Isaac, the father, the decision maker, the responsible one, the spiritual leader of the home, he says, I don't want to accept God's will. I want Esau to be the one. And he argues in his spirit with God to the point where he says, no, I don't want this to happen. See, Esau was a man of the outdoors. He was rugged. He was strong. He was everything that Jacob was not. And Isaac looked at Jacob, and he looked at Esau, and he said, Esau, he's the one I love. Of course, none of us have favorite children that we admit anyone else. No, I'm kidding. We love our daughters equally, even though they're both insane. No, uh, they're both different. That's the word I meant, different. But Isaac, straight up real, I don't, I, don't, I don't want Jacob to rule over Esau. I don't care if God said it or not. And so like a branch to a vine, he's bobbing and weaving from the pruning shears. He's been chosen by God. God has specifically chosen Isaac through whom the promise will come. From Abraham to Isaac, Isaac now to Jacob. And Isaac says, I don't want it. And we've all been there, haven't we? We've all looked at the future and said, God, I don't want that. I realize this is what you have for me but I want what I want. And so what does Isaac do? He tries to trick God. He tries to trick God. Go to Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 4, and let me show you what I mean. It says, when Isaac was old, this is 27 verse 1, and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, and Esau answered, here I am. Isaac said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your, your quiver and your bow, and go out into the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious foods, food that I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, and then look at this, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, this is normal, a normal time for a father to bless his son when he's about to die. But what you may not notice from this passage, it may not be openly clear. Isaac isn't dying. If you do a study, in fact, one Bible scholar says Isaac lived another 42 years after this. He's not dying. He's trying to God. He's trying to speed up the process. He's saying, hey, nobody's around. Nobody's looking. Let's just do the blessing now. Let's force God's hand. He says J Jacob will be the one. No, Esau, you go do this. You bring it to me, and I'm going to bless you. But you cannot trick God. Just because Isaac's got this favorite son, God has chosen. He has appointed. He has a plan. And true faith accepts the plan of God, pushes down our will and says, God, I want what your will. But you know what? We don't always want that. And Isaac straight up says, I don't want to. And so he tries to trick God. But you know what? God allows Jacob to trick Isaac, the younger, to trick his father. See, it's hard for us to fathom, but if you look in Scripture, God can use any resource he, can, he wants to to accomplish his plan. Because he knows how sinful and fallen we are. And he just pulls his hand back and lets that sinfulness, that wickedness, that connivingness of Jacob and of Rebekah to happen. And so God, I mean, we can look at Scripture. God uses godly people to accomplish his plans. He uses ungodly people, people like the Assyrian army. God can use whatever he wants. He even does miracles to accomplish his plan. And so God allows allows Jacob to trick Isaac, even as Isaac is trying to trick God.
But then we come to the point that the Hebrew writer is pointing to. Go to Genesis chapter 27, verses 33. Let me back up a little bit. I can sense that some of you are thinking, no, how do we know he's tricking God? Well, let's look at Genesis 27 for a moment, verses 28 and 29, and look at how Isaac blesses Esau. And in the midst of that blessing, I want you to notice how he is trying to defy God. Genesis 27, verses 28 and 29. Here's the blessing that, Esau, that Isaac gives to who he thinks is Esau. Verse 28, may God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. That's, that's pretty normal, normal blessing. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Again, normal words so far, but here it comes. Be Lord over your brothers. And may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. This is in direct defiance to what God has said. Isaac thinks it's Esau, his oldest, and he's blessing him and declaring to him, Let may all your brothers bow to you. He thinks he's tricked God. He thinks he's one. But then look at verse 33. What happens is God opens his eyes to the realization that he has just blessed the younger son, Jacob. Esau comes in. Here's the meal, Dad. Isaac says, wait a minute. What do you mean, here's the meal, Dad? I just blessed you. Um, I, I mean, I can eat, but I don't know if I need two meals. And he realizes Look what he says in verse 33. The Bible says, Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me, and I ate it all before you came? And I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. I want you to notice that phrase. Then Isaac trembled very violently. In the Hebrew word, what that literally means is he shook with fear. Not he shook with anger. Not he got so mad and raged that he was shaking. No, he shook with fear. If you look down in verse 35, you can see that he knows who he just blessed. He knows the answer to the question of who was it that hunted game and brought it to me that I've just blessed. He knows it was Jacob. He trembled with fear because he realized something. This whole time he's been trying to trick God. God was still in control. And that this whole time that he has been trying to orchestrate things so that God's will won't happen, that the pruning shears won't cut, God still cut. God still chose. God's will was still going to happen. And he realized at this moment, this whole time, Isaac had been an enemy of God. He had been against what God had said. And now he was helpless, standing before Almighty God to answer for what he had been trying to do. He rejected the will of God, but God's will still happened. You can't trick God. You can't run away from him. When God chooses, God chooses. He wants us to have peace in our lives as we submit to his will. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, He keeps him in perfect peace whose heart is stayed on him, on God. Jeremiah 29 11 says, I, Behold, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a future and a hope, not to harm you, but sometimes when we're faced with God's will, we look at it and say, I don't want it. We don't believe that it's good. We know what we're supposed to do in our marriages. We know what God's word says, the person we're supposed to be. And oftentimes we don't want it. We know, many of us know what God has called us to do. God is commanding us to do and share with us, and we've got a decision that we've been putting off, or even trying to orchestrate so that it won't happen, and God says, I have chosen you. Will you 
trust me? Will you put your faith in me or not? I know what you want, Isaac. You think this is best. But I've already chosen, and I know the heart of man, and I know I've chosen your younger son. And at that moment, Isaac trembled with fear as he realized, I have been an enemy of God. But then, you know what? I believe the second instantaneous thought came right behind that first one. And I'm still breathing. I've got a chance. I've got a choice. See, God has revealed to me that he knew the whole time I've been his enemy and I've been working against him. I've been harboring these plans and coming up with these schemes to trick God. And this whole time, he has been merciful to me. And I've got one more chance. I've got another chance, another choice to make. And so that's why he says at the end of verse 33, yes, and he will be blessed. I am not changing my mind. I am not saying, okay, I was wrong. Let's do this again. I accept that God's will is best. Yes, and he shall be blessed. Go to Genesis 28, verses 3 and 4. We can see as Isaac is now sending his younger son Jacob off to go get a wife, Look at how he blesses him again. And Isaac says to Jacob, God Almighty bless you, make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. Again, normal blessing, but here comes. Verse 4, may God give you the blessing of Abraham and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. By faith, Isaac said, I'm broken. God, I accept your will. Take it away. What you're asking of me, I accept it. I'm not going to pursue my wants anymore. Jacob, go with the promises of God. Go, may your, your offspring, not Esau's, your offspring be the one through whom the promise comes. I bow and I accept it. And Isaac was broken. It wasn't too late. Hear me, if you are here and breathing, it's not too late. See, it is God's will for us. Number one, it is God's will for us to admit that we are sinners in need of a Savior. I don't care how rich we are, how strong we are, how smart we are. Spiritually, we are dead before God. And the very first thing God demands of us is that it is His will for us to repent, turn to Him, and cry out to be saved. And from that moment on, the command of God doesn't change except my will. Follow me. Live by faith. It was by faith that Isaac blessed the sons. What did it say there? Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. He didn't fight anymore. He accepted the breaking of God. You know, Jesus told the Pharisees there, I think it's Matthew 28. He had just told a parable of how he had gone away, a king had gone away to prepare a kingdom for himself, and he left tenants for his field, but they refused to accept him as king. And at the end of that parable, Jesus says this, for the cornerstone, haven't you heard? Isaiah, haven't you heard? The cornerstone has become the chief cornerstone, and this rock, anyone who falls on it will be broken to pieces but anyone it falls on will be crushed. There's no other option. We must accept the breaking of God. Either we fall on Jesus Christ and cry out to Him for salvation and allow Him to break apart our lives and take away our will and say, not my will, but your will be done, just like Jesus did as our example. Or we refuse to fall on Jesus. And one day when Jesus returns, 
to judge the world. Those who refuse to fall on Jesus and to have our dreams and our plans and our careers that we want to be broken into pieces. Those who refuse to accept him as Lord and Savior, they're crushed. By faith, Isaac was broken, but he accepted God's will at the very end. Verse 21 now. We go to, to Joseph. Sorry, to Jacob, Isaac's son. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Again, some of your translations say staff, some of it say bed. It's the same idea. It's pointing to the fact that he is about to die. And if you know the story of Jacob, you know that it's not an ex a far exaggeration to say he wasn't a completely holy man. But there came a time when Jacob wrestled with God. God brought him to the end of himself and said, you are not walking with me. And it's a beautiful story. J Jacob is traveling and God sends angels to intercept him. We're not going to take time because we're running out of time. But God sends angels to in intercept Jacob. And Jacob said, this is the camp of God. And then what Jacob does is crazy. He sends everyone else away. And then he wrestles with God. There he lay down in bed, and a dream, he had the angel of the Lord there with him. He grabbed him, and he was wrestling with him. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I want what you want now, God. I bow to you. I want your will. I'm tired of running from you. And a little later on, God even changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Israel means the one who wrestled, who strained with God. The one who refused to give up. He hung on to God. And then God brings him back to the story that his father had of choosing the younger son over the older son. Go to Genesis 48, verses 11 through 14. See, Jacob was told by his sons that Joseph was killed, one of his favorite sons, son of his wife, Rachel. And for more than a decade... He thought Joseph was dead. And now he's reunited with his son. And in worship, verse 48, verses 11 through 14, Israel, and Israel, that's Jacob with his name, said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has not only let me see your face, but he's let me see your offspring also. And then Joseph removed them from his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both. He took his sons, Ephraim on his right hand, towards Israel's left, Manasseh on his left hand, towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. And Israel, that's Jacob, stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head. Manasseh's crossing his hands because Manasseh was the firstborn. We don't see it in Scripture when God specifically told him to do this, but Jacob understands. This new man, Israel, understands. This is God saying, I want you to obey now. Is it my will or is it your will? Your father struggled with this. Will you? Joseph doesn't understand. He tries to correct his father, but Israel is not swayed. Verse 19, Israel refused and said, I know my son, I know. Manasseh shall also be a, become a people. He also shall be great. Nevertheless, Ephraim, his younger brother, shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. God gave Jacob, after wrestling with him, another chance. I don't know if you've been wrestling with God about something. You know, Jacob, I don't want to take too much time on this, Jacob, when he wrestled with God, at the very end, the angel of the Lord touched his hip and it went out of socket. 
and he limped. And we can think in our human flesh, how horrible is that? He didn't heave to maim him. That's not fair because we're thinking with human eyes. What is God's will? God's will was to do this. Why? Because you know what? For generations, the Israelite people remember this story. We need to wrestle with God. We need to call out Him and hold on to Him and say, I don't want to let go until you bless me. God, I want your will, want not, not my will. The Scripture tells us that Jews, even to this day, will not eat the meat from that portion of the hip as a testimony to what God did for Jacob. See, God loves you, and He's merciful, and He's chosen you. If you believe in Jesus Christ, he has chosen you, he's got a plan for you, he's got a purpose for you, but we must lay down our will. True faith in God lays down our will and says, not my will, but your will. Now, we can argue with God and be broken. We can wait towards the end of our life and then bow before God, or we can be like Joseph and bloom even in the most dry desert place you can imagine. Joseph bloomed. Sorry, I didn't for that. There's your verses, by the way. Joseph bloomed. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. You know, if there's one story that exemplifies faith, even in the midst of difficult times, it's the story of Joseph. He didn't understand a lot of stuff. He just knew one thing. God was in control. God was going to make a way. God was the one who had promised even though Joseph lived in some very extremely difficult places, his heart never left the promised land. I mean, think about his life. He's thrown into a pit by his brothers. Then he's a part of a slave caravan. And then he's thrown into slavery of an Egyptian commander. Then, through no fault of his own, he's thrown into Pharaoh's prison. Then he, he helps another prisoner and hopes that this prisoner is going to get him out of jail and that other prisoner forgets him for another two years. And finally, after 13 years, he's made Pharaoh's second in command. And through this whole time, the heart of Joseph says, I want to be in the promised land. I don't want to be here. I don't belong here. Listen to what he said to another, that other prisoner in Genesis 14, sorry, 40, verses 14 and 15. Joseph speaking to that other prisoner in Pharaoh's prison says this, Only remember me when it is well with you. Please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I've done nothing that they should put me into the pit. He says, I don't belong in this pit. And I'll tell you what, I don't even belong in this land. I belong in the promised land, the land that God has promised my people. That's where my heart is. But you know what? God's got me here. The Bible says, whatever Joseph did, he trusted in God and God blessed him. God blessed him. Even to the point that when he had a chance for retribution against his brothers, the ones that had tr thought about killing him and eventually sold him into slavery, those guys, what does Joseph say? Verses four, chapter 45, verses 4 through 8. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And when they came near, Joseph said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. And now, now don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. I mean, he doesn't sugarcoat it. They did sell him there. He says, no, because God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there's yet another five years in which there's going to be neither plowing nor harvest. God's in control. He's the one who sent me here. Verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, to keep the Jews alive, to keep his promise fulfilled. 
Verse 7, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of over all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Joseph bloomed where he was planted. He said, you know what, God, this is not where I want to be. But I'm your child and this is where you want me to be. So I want your will. I bow to you. I want to live as you would have me live. Not my life anymore. It's yours. But what does the Hebrew writer put to? He says, he makes mention of the Exodus. Go to Genesis 50, verse 24 through 26, and we'll close there. And Joseph said to his brothers... I'm about to die. He's not like, like you know, Isaac. He, he really is about to die. He says, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Remember that? He swore it to great-granddad and granddad and our dad. That God has swore that he will bring us to this land and then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Don't leave me here. This is not where I belong. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put into a coffin in Egypt. And you know what? Over 100 years later, Moses makes sure that Joseph's bones are taken with them as they start the exodus. And you know what else? Joshua makes sure that those bones are carried into the promised land and buried where they belong. God is a God of promises. But we have to want His promises. We have to be willing to submit. Some of us may have never given our lives fully to Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, we believe him. In other words, we know his name. We know some uh, information about him. But we've never said, I repent. That means 180 degrees. I turn away from being king of my own life. And I say, God, I need you. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. And please be my Lord, my boss. I give you my life. Some of us have never done that. Others of us have not through in whatever God has commanded of us. Praise the Lord, right after this service, in just a few minutes, we're going to go be a part of a baptism service, which is that first step of saying, look at me, God has saved this person. And I testify it by obediently submitting to believer's baptism. What a great thing to watch and to be a part of. Some of us haven't followed through in that. Some of us are struggling with God even now. Some of us are struggling with, it's well with my soul. Whatever it is that God has for you, you may not be living in the land you wanted to be in. You may be hoping for something different, and still God says, I've got you here for this purpose at this time. Bloom now. You did not choose me, Jesus said, but I chose you, and I've Pointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Let's pray. God, you know our frailty, you know our weakness, and you still love us. You're still merciful to us. God, when Moses wanted to see you and said, Show me your glory, the glory that you showed to Moses was truth. That you are a merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. God, you're a just God. You won't just pretend that sin doesn't happen. No, you will punish sin. But God, you've punished sin already through the death of your son, Jesus. And those of us who will believe in Jesus, put our trust in the name of Jesus Christ, will call out. Jesus for salvation, He will save us. And God, those of us that have been saved know this to be true, that your mercy 
and your patience and your grace, they never end. You still call us to obedience. You still call us to submit our will to you. God, my prayer is that you would help me bloom, blossom where you have me, that I won't wait until I'm broken, that I won't wait until the end of my life before I bow. But God, that you would use me for your kingdom purposes, that you may produce for yourself through my life your fruit. May this be our prayer this morning, we pray. It's in the name of Jesus we ask.